Hi, everyone, and welcome to a new issue of the People Sales Dispatch. So, uh, as most will know or have heard from previous issues of the People Sales Dispatch, uh, of course, we know that the World Health Organization is the international agency that we all look at uh, when we want to know about people's health, about health systems, and about global health. But then again, recently, uh, we have noticed. Um, an increase in the influence of the so-called international financial institutions. Uh, so the uh, World Bank, for example, and the International Monetary Fund, uh, which, which are not agencies with a health mandate, but they do tend to push out the WHO out of the picture. So, um, and one of those institutions, as I said, is the World Bank. Uh, today, we're going to do an interview uh, to learn more about how the World Bank influences health uh, in the Global South and also in other parts of the world. And we are joined by Natalie Rhodes, who's a PhD researcher at Leeds University, uh, and Remco van der, pa van der Pas, uh, who's a researcher at the Center for Planetary Health, and they are both affiliated with PHM. So welcome, Natalie, and welcome, Remco. Okay, so uh, let's maybe start with um, with hearing your thoughts on the formal mandate of the World Bank. You know, when it comes to health, does it have any any formal mandate to influence health policies? Uh, and does this have you know does this differ from from reality in any way? Let me, let me just kick off the yeah. the the World Bank does. Mm, it's it does not have the mandate uh directly to uh to work in 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 health um but its mandate is to find to finance development and uh to to facilitate uh investment and international investments to uh, that helps um a stabilizing economic uh, policy outcomes of countries contributing to economic growth and uh, by that, and the, um, let's say the, the 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 loans and the and the finance that they provide, they in their indirectly uh, shape, let's say, um, health projects uh, in uh, across across the world. But it's uh, technically they can um, governments have this have a space to reject that. They don't have to do that. It's not. Uh, uh, the, the the formal mandate for international health is with the WHO, so it's uh, it's uh, it's it's an, it's an indirect one, I would say. I don't know if Natalie would could, would like to add on that. Um, yeah, I would agree, and I'd but I'd also add. Um, how World Bank has changed since its inception and how it's got increasingly involved in health. Um, initially more indirectly, but I'd also add that now quite directly in terms of it's now one of the biggest actors, particularly if you look on the, the global stage, um, across global health, um, it's one of the biggest funders of health programs around the world. It also is hugely influential in shaping agendas, not just through the actual money and the type of programs that they fund, but, you know, if you go to kind of events, you often see for World Bank, this person speaking, they're seen as quite prestigious um, and very influential in what they contribute and the influence that they have on agendas. Um, and then also one way they have influence and perhaps business is a bit more indirect is like they create a lot of evidentiary knowledge as well, uh, both on like health outcomes and status of different health systems and also the type of evidence they create for what interventions might work. So there's lots of different paths um, that it shapes health. Yeah. And so very, very influential, perhaps, you know, one of the most powerful actors in health now. Yes. And then, of course, you know, during the pandemic, we also saw uh, international financial institutions uh, joining the health discussion in new ways. And we saw reactions uh, in, in their fora uh, by countries, by members uh, to actually see an, 
how the international financial institutions can be used and how they can actually support uh, providing uh, more ample healthcare. And one of those initiatives was, of course, the TRIPS waiver in initiative uh, at um, so um, the, at the World Trade Organization. But if we look at the World Bank, so the discussion there uh, was uh, was somewhat different, and I believe that recently. Uh, there was a new pandemic preparedness and response uh, fund, which was launched by the World Bank. Uh, so I was wondering, Natalie, if maybe you could tell us a bit more about this and why it's important, why should be, we be looking at this more closely? Yeah, so this fund was created in response. It's basically this number was going around estimating that we need an extra $10.5 billion per year to be spent on pandemic preparedness and response to more effectively strengthen global architecture to respond better to future pandemics. Um, so the fund was kind of created out of this need and the aim was like catalyze this funding. Um, but it's been a very quick process of when it was announced and now next month it's expected it's going to be opening its first proposals. So it follows a model that's um, seen across World Bank. They've got many different types of these funds. Um, but if we look at this fund specifically, some of the kind of key things that are coming out of it and perhaps concerns is one, um, it's not being particularly successful at raising this 10.5 billion. It's not, um, they, I think, and we just have a maybe two or three billion raised from funders um so how is effective is it going to be in that area also in the scope um if you look at the type of activities that i mentioned on its website that it wants to focus on it's much more on response rather than actual preparedness um so it's not necessarily about strengthening health systems but it's better how can we better able like res uh, rapport and surveillance of health outbreaks. So that's a really important area that's been potentially going to be missed there. Um, and also a key thing to look at that is coming out is around the governance structure of the fund. So the design process, there was some potentially superficial um, engagement with uh, outside of funders about the design process. Um, and it's now, if you compare it to other funds, it's you could say it, it's more inclusive in the sense that on the, the decision-making body, it's not just funders, as has been in other funds, but you actually have, um, so you've got nine funders on there with voting power, nine kind of implementing countries or co-investors, they're being called, uh, one philanthropy seat and two CSO seats. But um, it's... Mm, even with that in place, if you look at other similar funds or kind of governance arrangements, it's not particularly hopeful that programmes that will get funded through this will actually match national or local priorities in terms of the actual gaps in health systems and that they'll actually match priorities set by governments and governance and funding mechanisms already in place. So these funds can actually just create more administrative work and a greater burden on recipient countries um, and may not actually create sustainable changes and strengthening health systems where it's needed. So that's kind of the big concern and it's potentially just going to kind of be business as usual um, with funders, you know, kind of potentially having a lot of influence and calling shots about where their money wants to be spent based on their own national priorities and political um, political will. Let me, uh, so the question is, what is, what is new with this fund vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, other uh, funds that they've been doing in the past? Well, you, you, you see that this, uh, this financing facility mechanism is now rather established within the world by the World Bank. So it's not only in health. Uh, there was the, of course, there was the, um, the global financing facility for the, for the mother and child health uh, pro programs that is known by, uh, in, in the health field. But they do it also in relation to other um, uh, domains, especially uh, in relation to environmental projects, etc. Uh, so they have a, so it's 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 streamlined across different uh, sectors and domains. So they take a certain template and then impose it uh, also for working uh, in health. 
And uh, the idea, because it's very it's focused on efficiency, on results, it's very targeted on relative short-term outcomes. But one could argue uh, whether such a fund would actually, uh, what it does with uh, with public capacity and uh, at uh, at the national level. And I think that's that's a major concern. That's not new for the for the World Bank. So they always bring in consultancies, private actors, whether NGOs or others, to, to work with them to get their results done. So there's a, a big question also about uh, sustainability uh, there of all those projects next to next to the whole uh, the whole the whole financial question. So who pays for it in the end is whether these are grants or loans, how is the how, how does this ties into debt restructuring? And in that regard, it's uh, it's uh, old wine, uh, quite smartly packaged in in new bottles. And what is more worrying is so. So for what reason? Huh? With the new pandemic uh, fund, is very, whose risk is being covered here? I mean, the global fund. It's about HIV AIDS. You could argue it's really targeted for uh, health co- health outcomes, uh, access to treatment in uh, in lower middle income countries. But this is about protection against for pandemic risk that might affect the global north so to say and that i find also more that's really different from the global funds before i would say uh, this is where the whole one health logic also comes in but um I'll leave it with here and Natalie, you were saying, you know, that uh, it's only one of those things that the World Bank is trying to push at global level for uh, when it comes to health. And then um, if we look at some of the other things that it's advocating for, some of the policies and some of the things that it's trying to, you know, support um, directly or indirectly, uh, we also find the concept of universal health coverage, but also of uh, public-private partnerships, the PPPs. So, um could we maybe spend a couple of minutes talking about that? You know, how, uh, what is the World, World Bank's uh, influence on the implementation of these kind of programs? And what does this actually lead uh, when we talk about access to health and people's right to health? Um, so the, the public-private partnership model is actively um, and in a way actually mandated by World Bank in their funds, and you see in the pandemic preparedness and response, there's these kind of implementing entities, which if states or organisations want to apply for funding, they have to collaborate with one of these organisations. So these, um, the list has come out for this one, I think last week, and this includes a different bank. So for example, Asian Development Bank also includes Gavi, the Global Fund, but it also does include the World Health Organisation um, and CEPI. But Through doing this and through kind of actively encouraging, requiring these involvement of private actors, it's directly feeding and driving this perception that we need private market solutions and they are key and play an integral role in the provision of health and that states and public approaches can't work alone, um, which just ties in with the, the whole neoliberal agenda and how that's impacting our health systems, increase in privatisation of health. Um, And this is obviously directly in contest with the aim to provide healthcare, particularly primary healthcare, which is very important, that's accessible at free point of care for all, um, when you've got private actors who obviously just have different priorities and different ways of working. Um, and how in the long term, what does this mean for health systems and particularly around state provision of health um, and how the work of World Bank is, you know, actively kind of accelerating this. Anything to add, Remco? Uh, yeah, you refer to universal health coverage and how the World Bank uh, has tied into that. Uh, universal health coverage is built on the Western model of um, social health insurance wh- where there is um, uh, where it which is based more and more on public private uh, collaborations where there is uh, 
what what is it strategic um how uh, they call it strategic contracting of uh, of uh, of providers where there's packages where it's often the ge- negotiation with efficiency uh and um and and and, and ensuring that uh, a, a certain package is provided but often then also um a kind of a cherry picking approach uh, focused on on treatment rather than on on prevention and uh, that model um I, so you will the, the who's report on the health financing uh, for health systems comes from 2010 and since then you have seen that the world bank uh and they do this they also have they have this joint monitoring report between between them that comes out every nine they're collaborating in the uhc 2030 partnership and they talk about so it's all about the argument that there should be more domestic investment in health services without acknowledging that the international financial system hollows out any potential for real domestic investment uh, in, in, in stronger health systems. So then uh, international uh, financial investment can, co- can come in in the form of private money that finances also health services and, and uh, uh, hospitals, etc., uh, and that are tied into the UHC concept. And then it's up to the state to regulate it and to ensure that that, uh, that, that fits within uh, that public health needs and that uh, uh, packages are being, are being covered there. Um, but of course, with many uh, states having very limited uh, possibility to actually regulate that, and with very strong lobbies, both domestically and internationally to focus on certain uh, service provision then you see that uh, uh, that the the actual service gets skewed into a certain into a certain uh, direction which often focus more on the provision for services for the middle class and then basic services get uh, get hollowed out and the way w, the way the world bank has always played with it uh, and and in not only the World Bank, but a lot of development organizations and NGOs as well, is this concept of performance-based financing as an um, incentive to improve health services. PBF may work in a very restricted setting on certain conditions, but as a whole, it's yeah, it leads to uh, it's it's a perverse incentive to do certain to certain things, but especially the more complex things required to uh, to comprehensively deal with problems. So that this is more also the social interlinkages that then always it falls out. Um, um, so that's that, so that's how they have engaged in, in universal health coverage. It's now interesting to see what happened after the pandemic, because a lot of countries, they are quite on their on, uh, in relation to UHC, they they have stagnated their uh, their coverage goals, etc. Uh, and so I, I find it also interesting that that whole UHC focus from the World Bank has also left a little bit now. Um, it's it's away from from their whole engagement more into into health security and pandemic preparedness. Okay, and then, you know, uh, this is what's happening on the global level and what you're seeing uh, when you look at the policy level. Uh, but if we look at how countries are actually experiencing and going through the, um, the World Bank uh, programs, um, are there any particular examples that come to mind? You know, when we talk about countries whose health systems have been hollowed out because of uh, World Bank policies, does any place in particular come to mind and what happened there, you know, just as an illustration of what what the World Bank actually means for people in real life? I'm just, I, I try to do this based on, uh, on, uh, on examples of international work I've been engaged in over the, over the years. <laughs> See, this is quite, it's quite difficult because they don't directly hollow out uh, projects. It's just that they don't do certain things. That's the, um, I'm 
So in uh, in to work via the Institute of Tropical Medicine in collaboration with Guinean partners. After Ebola, we've been working on health system strengthening and health workforce development. Mm -hmm. And then you see that the World Bank come in, in with projects to uh, where they finance maternal and child health care um, and also support for a while the, the provision of maternal health services, paying midwives to, uh, uh, to do their work. Uh, and doing vaccination, et cetera, uh, and surveillance, uh, especially post-Ebola with, uh, with the reforms. Um, and they get also funny at money, I think, via the Global Financing Facility uh, and before the, the, the Muskoka Fund on, uh, that's, that was initiated by the French G8 initiative on, uh, on, 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 on getting maternal and child health goals out. But once again, it's quite limited then to one this to one region in Guinea uh, with a certain number of healthcare services with a certain number of of service provision and even though they talk about a broader approach and tying it into national priorities you see at the end that it's quite limited to uh, to this to these specific aims so at the end of the so at the end of the project, I mean, it's not that those midwives then stay in, in, in they, they, they stay in job, or it's not that, that those goals can be sustained, but they have reached their, their goals. And then when they leave, uh, often also because of the, the service they contract in, it's up to the government to take that over. And that's now also expected. Eh? This is kind of a co-investor logic you also see in the in the in the new pandemic fund now and if that if that government does not have the the fiscal space or the finance to do that you see that it just crumbles afterwards so the world bank would then release its uh, its goals etc but if you look a little bit later on the whole su sustainability is quite uh, is quite limited um that's, so that's one example i had in i had in mind uh, thanks for sharing that. Yes, it uh, it really makes it concrete. Um, Natalie, do you want and to I add? Some? Yeah, or yeah, I don't have any exact country examples to bring up, but just kind of more of a highlighting a certain dynamic that will kind of lead to these what Remco just described. So, for example, if in a fund, maybe not necessarily with a new fund, but particularly of previous funds. If you have a decision making body is made entirely particularly of funders or even if not, and you do have kind of implementing countries also with decision making power. If a decision is made that this is we're going to make fund a proposal that is, for example, addressing maternal health um, or and you know, and, and you have a particular program, and if then that's okay, this is a program that's going to get delivered, um, kind of what position then can a government or a Ministry of Health or local like expert stakeholders have that decision's already been made? So do they, it's kind of this dilemma, do they say, no, we, we don't want a program like that in that area? That's not what is necessary. It's more pertinent to do X, Y, Z based off like the strategy and needs that we've identified. And if they say no, then they don't get any funding um, from that particular fund. So it's this dilemma of actually what do you do, you do when that happens? Um, and it's kind of prisoner's dilemma that states can face. And then they okay say yes. And then as Remco described, um, it's often not particularly sustainable and can just create an extra burden for countries and for governments where most of their people working on it and most of their resources is actually spent on reporting um, requirements, which can be mandated by funders because they want to have oversight and accountability because they also might have domestic pressures on how they're spending like aid, for example. So um, yeah, so that wasn't a particular example, but just trying to imagine what this decision-making process can actually, the dilemmas it can throw up. Thanks, thanks. Uh, thanks both for uh, for clarifying that. And then finally, um, maybe we could uh, 
we could just chat about, you know, uh, if you see any, um, any ways that the World Bank could actually do a better job at strengthening health systems, uh, you know, can it play this role or it has to be erased completely? But this is this is a, the question is what is to be expected from the World Bank uh, on the on the long term. And I think we need to be very humble there, uh, also geopolitically. What it uh, if it's really can be transformative and do things that would promote equity and social justice, etc. Uh, it's been born uh, out of the Bretton Woods Agreement and the institutions and uh, and the notion to further economic development and the whole growthism that it uh, that it supports um and and by by doing that it need to it need to disperse finance and it needs to mobilize also uh capital to through certain services whether it's public or private capital it's about expanding the cake and um the question is whether they are willing to do that on on, uh, on 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 social protection, for instance, on, on essential primary health care, or that they just follow the <clears throat> the incentives and that they facilitate, um, th that they create demand, so to say, yeah? because that's that's the idea about economic development is that you create uh, artificial demand that might not uh, might not necessarily exist. I think a little bit about uh, I don't know. Um, the whole notion about rota vaccination, I find very interesting, where also the Gates Foundation, etc., com comes in. Uh, is rota vaccination important? Yes, maybe, but at the same time, nutrition and essential uh, uh, wash provisions, etc. If one would have that, then you would need to have much less uh, uh, requests for rota vaccines, etc., and, and children would would be uh, enabled would have the uh, would be uh, well nourished enough and with their with a relative strong immune system to go through a rota um, virus infection, for instance. I, it's not to say that a, a vaccine should not have a role there, but then it's really up to the countries to decide whether a vaccination is part of their essential uh, service provision. Uh, and the World Bank could there then follow much more the national priorities and the national strategies that are being designed but that at the, at the moment it's very difficult for countries to 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 claim their autonomy be, because of the debts and because of the international financial regime they're locked in into a certain certain straitjacket so to give it to get to provide flexibility and to respect autonomy is something that they could do but given how it historically has been built up, I would think we should be very humble to expect that that actually happens. Probably the thing that I've been thinking about the most is, as I've already spoken about quite a bit around the governance. Um, and for me, the question, the thing that I've always been thinking about recently is if you look at you know, the, the stated goal take at face value, what the World Bank is wanting to do in terms of reducing poverty, improving health outcomes, strengthening health systems. Um, and, you know, it's not just in this call that we're talking about the need for more sustainable um, initiatives and more holistic health system strengthening. So if that's the case, then it's key that initiatives and programmes that are being funded actually match up with what is actually needed and the priorities set by that country. Um, and the question that I just keep on thinking about that I would like, like to pose rather than giving a, an answer, I guess, is then if we look at these governance structures, why do we have equal weighting to donors as we do to kind of implementing or recipient countries and to a bit more grapple with this power asymmetry, this relationship that exists between funders and recipients um is it actually helpful to have donors with so much power like why are they even there what are they adding and is this potentially undermining the actual success of these programs and interventions not that i think this will change but i feel like that's kind of the thing that i'm stuck at and i've not read or heard any real strong justification on why they need to be so heavily involved beyond 
No, but this is that's a very fundamental debate about so what what can we expect from official development assistance channeled through the World Bank, but also more bilateral and other channels, and whether it can be really transformative for for countries to uh, uh, to deal with 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 both the ecological and social crisis we're uh, we're in. Um, Maybe yes, but then it should really be linked also to the the economic uh, conditions and financial conditions that enables countries to uh, develop the, their economies in a way that that fits their their needs. This is the whole idea about a new international economic order uh, that was already posed in the in the seventies, and that really has to do with countries being flexible and choosing their their trade relations with other countries, including protection of their own industries, etc., having the flexibility also in relation to uh, creating debt or not, and how to how to fill in fiscal space to raise taxes. Now, if if countries would have that space, then there might be actually space also for uh, development finance to to support that, but. The, the 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 history from the last 40 50 years tells us that that's very it's only very limited being being uh, done so so um the development finance will only work if we give attention to that uh, to that economic order um and i think that ron or might have explained that about that as well in the articles and in the introduction of this of this series um uh, and I always find in discussions with the World Bank and with uh, when it's when it's focused on health systems, this discussion is delinked. It's taken out of the debate um, because it's too difficult. Um, and I guess this, this requires much more, uh, much more attention. 